This week, my interview of up-and-coming Marvel writer Jed McKay, whose books include the ongoing Black Cat title and the miniseries Taskmaster and Avengers Mechstrike. We talk about the changes in how Taskmaster has been portrayed since his debut in 1980, making Black Cat sexual but not cheesecake, how he inspires himself to write, and more. But first, if you're enjoying this podcast, support the show at patreon.com slash deconcomics for as little as $2 a month. With your pledge of at least $4 a month, you can access hours of bonus podcasts, including an issue-by-issue discussion of The Amazing Spider-Man by Lee and Ditko. Pledge your support now at patreon.com slash deconcomics. This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo. And now, my talk with Jed McKay. Okay, I'm on Zoom with Jed McKay in Nova Scotia. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm all right. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. I found not only are you writing like half of Marvel's books, <laughs> it seems like, but you've been doing a lot of interviews lately. Yeah, I've been kind of kind of getting out there, I guess. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Because I usually, before I interview somebody, I like to kind of check out other interviews with them, and I just I found so many I couldn't couldn't consume them all. Yeah, that's it's it, well. It seems like I've always got kind of like a book book ending, then a book starting, and you got to do do a whole new round of promo every time you start a new book, you know. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the, the black hat when I hate is the black hat's back, so you got to do a whole new round of promo for the new number one, and yeah, it's a uh, it's a whole thing. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, sure. Okay. Well, let's talk about all that. But first, uh, I usually like to start out with the uh, kind of questions about like when you were a kid. So, like, uh, what comics did you read when you were a kid? I heard on another interview you were talking about reading your dad's comics collection. So, tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, when I was a kid, I wasn't. Uh, I, I really wasn't reading much that was coming out at the time. Because you actually have to buy new comics, whereas my dad had like okay, I have them now, like just big Rubbermaids full of old comics from the seventies, some from the sixties, and some from the eighties. Moving on, but that's basically what I grew up reading uh, was you know mostly Marvel, uh, you know seventies superhero stuff, and you know superhero Jason stuff. Hmm, like like uh, what Spider Man Avengers? Uh, yeah, so there's. You know, Avengers, Daredevil, uh, a lot of uh, Conan, a lot of Master of Kung Fu, hmm. uh, uh, Iron Man, uh, you know, some amounts of Batman, depending on who was drawing it, uh, some Superman stuff, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the Kirby Fourth World stuff have gotten the boxes there. Hmm. So it was a pretty, it's a pretty broad range, basically whatever my dad was interested in the seventies <laughs> that some that survived up. Up until uh, the time I got to it, were you into like newspaper comic strips at all? Uh, to a certain extent, I was uh, a bit when I was younger. I mean, obviously, I read a lot of Calvin and Hobbes because uh, you know the the nineties was a real heyday for putting out those collected albums. Uh, I was I was really into really, like you know, Bloom County, mm-hmm. which is weird because in retrospect, uh, it was about. You know, fifty to seventy percent eighties politi- American political references, none of which I got. Yeah, who's Michael Deaver? <laughs> yeah, I was like, uh, it, it, a lot of it just went over my head, but I, I like the um, just the sort of manic intensity to the art. Uh, mm-hmm. It really appealed to me when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, Calvin Hobbes, Bloom County, uh, stuff like that, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Uh, it kind of went through a, a few iterations, really. Uh, there, was, there was a while when I wanted to you know, make comics when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, I grew up in Maritime Canada, and you basically nothing of pop culture would come from here. Mm. Uh, or, like, you know, the, the popular pop culture. Like, there's, of course, you know, local stuff. And then it's just stuff that I wouldn't have access to, like, you know, like the, the music scene, for instance, in Halifax was a big deal, but... I lived in rural Prince Edward Island at that point in time, so it's not 
something that really made its way to where I was. So then I just kind of, I kind of moved beyond that. I decided I was going to become a teacher. Uh, but then when I was a teenager, I got into sort of comics again for the second time where I was getting, you know, I, I would be getting previews magazine or the previews catalog uh, every month because I was buying enough books at the local store. Mm. And um, I was really getting into a lot of, you know, indie stuff. And I think, well, this is, this is the kind of thing I could do. I can, you know, train myself to draw better. So I, I would draw a lot when I was a kid, but never pursued it uh, to the extent that I would have to if I wanted to be a professional comic artist. Mm. And uh, so when I was going through university, uh, I was involved in uh, the message boards, and the bullet board systems for uh, uh, aspiring comic creators. I was before Facebook or you know, Reddit or anything like that. So that was mm. basically the equivalent of social media for young people on the internet who wanted to make comics. Uh, that's basically how I got to actually making comics. I hooked up with a friend of mine, Sheldon Bella, on uh, one of the boards, uh, Enter Void. And we just started making comics together and we put them on the internet. And they're like really kind of crass and shitty. But... Uh, <laughs> I mean, as comics are that you make when you're like 21 and in like the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. But uh, what, what yeah, were those comics about? It was kind of like an anachronistic, uh, violent comedy. Uh, you know, people would be like, the heroes would go into like repossess a water buffalo in ancient uh, Siam or, uh, uh, geez, I'm like facing out, like facing out of a samurai who shit talked them or like dealing with druids and stuff like that. There, it was it was extremely dumb, and uh, like there, there was really good. The writing was pretty terrible, but um, that was actually how I got into working in comics professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, Sheldon, the artist, uh, was really getting out there. He's a great artist, and Marvel brought him in to do some anthology stuff. And on one of those anthology stories, he brought me in to write it because he mm-hmm. didn't know anything about the superheroes that were going on in the Marvel universe. I was like, shit, yeah, I'll do that. So that was my my first first paid comics job was uh, like an eight page anthology story uh, for X Men Servant Protect number four uh, with Sheldon and so yeah, that was about ten years ago. Ten years ago, okay. Let's talk a little bit about Taskmaster. Sure. Um, it's interesting to me how kind of the portrayal of him has changed over the years because. I mean, I'm very old. I remember when when he first appeared in Avengers in 1980, um, right. and you know it was really just completely serious then. Um, now the portrayals I see of him more recently are some level of goofy, even though he is also serious in a way. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, how do you see him? How what's the how goofy do you see him as being? That's, I mean, here's the thing is that the, the Taskmaster comic that I write is, you know, it's kind of a goofy comic. I uh, try to put some jokes in and just sort of look at the absurd, uh, kind of the absurdity of the character and specifically how he looks. Where, like, I really love Taskmaster's costume, but I think it really works in the fact that it's very much, a, you know, a, a very late 70s, very early 80s character costume hmm. that hasn't really changed mm-hmm. like there's there's been attempts to modernize and change it for years but i don't think it works uh, i think it's best when he stays as that like kind of snapshot of these really uh you know flamboyant uh over the top costume so he's got his pirate boots he's got his white cape he's got his skull face <laughs> he's got his, like flared gloves and rather than be embarrassed by that i think it's better to lean into it and embrace the sort of absurd aspect of it and then the, the absurd aspect of just him as a character this person that exists in this world i mean taskmaster even when he was serious he was still a business guy you know he's not dr doom he's not going to take over the world he's not even mm-hmm. going to take over new jersey he's a guy who he works he runs a business he's he's a, he's a small business owner he's an entrepreneur he's a mogul and there's something that's just kind of fun about how mundane an idea that is in a world where people are regularly like trying to blow up the moon with a laser 
or you know trying to turn time backwards or you know any of this other weird bullshit that superheroes get up to it, where you have a guy who's just trying to make a living while also dressed up as you know party city skeletor mm-hmm. and his his ringtone is nine to five <laughs> i mean really he, he, illustrates he, he, it. He, exactly he's, he's a working man and you know what he loves dolly He's, he's secure in his masculinity. He doesn't have to impress anybody. He's Taskmaster. <laughs> Actually, in retrospect to that first appearance, it's it's a little odd what... Uh, let's see, who who was that? I just looked this up yesterday. Um, Dave Cockrum drew him. Oh, Michelini. David Michelini uh, was the writer. And he had Taskmaster you know, working in the school for henchmen. He was running a school for uh, hench. I don't. I don't think they've done that bit for a long time now. But uh, um, I'm, I'm, it's a little surprised that they that surprising that they had him doing that at the time. In retrospect, I mean, it made sense at the time because we'd never seen him before. But yeah, and I think it's. I think it's a really neat idea because I don't think it's something that people have really done before. Mm-hmm. And ultimately. Uh, you know, these henchmen have to come from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> like they don't, like they don't just, you know, pop out fully formed. So, and again, you know, people got to work and, you know, they, they provide the uniform. So you're all set. <laughs> the first time I read the first issue, I had this sense that I was watching an MCU movie somehow more than I do with any other Marvel comic. I'm not sure what it was about the tone. It just seemed like the right tone and then listening to one of your interviews i learned that taskmaster is supposed to be in this black widow movie that we might see someday uh yeah. <laughs> and uh so was the, this taskmaster miniseries was supposed to coincide with the movie yeah um when around the time the movie was like getting its release date and getting the trailers out you saw like a whole range of new black widow related stuff coming out like there was uh, the new Black Widow series, I believe, mm-hmm. was out then, or is that Web of Black Widow? Yeah, I, I uh, believe you're like, right. Yeah, it was, um, you know, the uh, Widowmakers with Red Guardian, uh, and I think the other Black Widow whose name I can never remember, and then of course Taskmaster. So because these are all characters who are appearing in this film, and you know, corporate synergy is a thing, right? Mm-hmm. So. If they've got a movie coming out, they want to have a book coming out at the same time. Because what better time to sell a book with these characters? Yeah. Uh, as far as the content of the book, it didn't really influence it much, other than the editor saying, "We're doing a Taskmaster book, and you got to have Black Widow in it." I'm mm-hmm. Like, okay, we can work with that. It's no problem. <laughs> well, so I was listening to the iFanboy podcast, and they were talking about your book, and then the Taskmaster in the Thunderbolts book. They said that his characterization was somewhat different there, and it got me sure. thinking about how, like, I mean, like 20, 30 years ago, you know, or like when I was growing up, you know, the, Marvel was really strict about continuity that whatever a character was doing right now, he had to be doing only that. And if right. it would, if he appeared in another book, it had to be kind of linked up with that other book. And now they don't really seem to care anymore. What's what's the uh, attitude towards that kind of continuity nowadays in Marvel? I mean, I think people. I mean, a lot of the sort of continuity research you're kind of doing on your own. Um, but I mean, just just out of uh, efficiency, if I'm having to ask an editor about every single thing I'm doing, it's much easier to try to find it out myself, given that I have much greater access to information. But as far as a, a character's characterization across the books, I can't really speak to it that much. I mean, this Taskmaster series is supposed to start in April uh, of last year. Hmm. So, and then obviously Thunderbolts was going to start till King of Black. Uh, I mean, Taskmaster is also in uh, Iron Fist right now, or was mm-hmm. at least in the first issue. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you do see th- three pretty different portrayals of the same character. And... I mean, I, I just I can't really say it's something that bothers me that much. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think the kind of relaxing a hold on uh, the accepted characterization of certainly a lower tier character is kind of useful because it allows you to tell different stories with them, yeah. and gives gives readers different sort of views or different slants on them. Like, I mean, 
editors are going to be very, uh, I don't know what strict is the right word, but you know, very firm in the characterization of, for instance, Captain America mm-hmm. uh, in a way that they're not going to be for, you know, Taskmaster. Yeah. And part of it is also that Taskmaster, just sort of by the nature of a character he is, he's a guy who shows up in a lot of places. And that's going to lead to kind of divergent uh, versions of him. And I, I don't think it bothers me. Yeah, well, I mean, it seems like the attitude is now that if they get too strict about it, that it can make it hard to, to, to for writers to tell the stories they want to tell. And it seems like they're kind of prioritizing that more than, no, Galactus is in this book doing this right now, so he can't be over here in this other book, too. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like you're always you're always going to get a certain amount of that, but um, I don't know how useful it is for certain characters. Like, obviously, you're not going to have Galactus in one book when he's dead in another book, or something like that. <laughs> but I mean, Taskmaster's he's he's like the professional henchman. Well, he's a, a top tier henchman, but he's the guy that people go to to get things done, and he's a, he's a fun character. He's got a great you know power set. He looks great. Uh, he's a bit of a sassy boy. And uh, yeah, he's just he's fun to throw in any book that you can. So it's, it's not a surprise that he's been kind of popping up all over the place here. Yeah. Now I was a little surprised when Black Cat series came out, and it was an ongoing and not a mini because I, there haven't been very many ongoings that feature villains. Although I guess it's happening somewhat more these days. Do you have, do you think that they would ever do a Taskmaster ongoing? Uh, I mean, I think it would be great. Uh, It's ultimately the thing that decides whether or not a a character would get an ongoing from a mini is how well that mini sold, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I I would love to continue to work with Taskmaster. I have a lot of other ideas I'd love to get to with them. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether or not that will happen, I don't know. I think it would be great. I mean, you know, Deadpool started out as a villain. He's been making money for Marvel for quite some time now. Mm Mm-hmm. I was wondering if you could clear up something for me because another podcast made me question how I've been reading this word all these years. So the the Marvel version of the mafia that's spelled mm-hmm. M-A-G-G-I-A, how how do you pronounce it or expect it to be pronounced? Well, the way I pronounce it is with no expectation that that is the correct pronunciation. <laughs> I, it's just, I just call them the magia and uh, mm. go with it. Okay, that's uh, what I've been saying all these years, too, Magia. Okay, because I was hearing Magia on another podcast. And I'm like, well, they're probably just guessing, too, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that would be one G, surely. Hmm, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, I could see arguments for to be the Magia, but, I mean, if, it's, if you're already, you know, bagging on the, the Mafia, the Magia sounds about right. So that's right. Uh, yeah, I thought you should be pronounced similar to mafia, just with G's. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Um, okay. So Black Cat. So it was an ongoing, and then it got temporarily canceled because of the pandemic when there were no comics coming out. Um, mm-hmm. So hmm, how, how did it come about that they decided to do an ongoing on her? Uh, it was something that that as far as my knowledge goes spun out of her appearance in um, amazing spider-man when uh, nick spencer brought her back hmm. uh there was that whole uh, thieves guild arc in amazing spider-man where odessa drake was uh, introduced mm-hmm. and um you know she and the thieves guild were stealing all the superhero stuff and then black cat and spider-man went and got it back so i got an email from nick Lowe, uh, who i worked with previously on daughters of the dragon and he said you know i really like daughters of the dragon uh, obviously, it's not something that is really going to get an ongoing <laughs> because it's fairly it's a fairly niche title. But I'd really like it. Uh, I really like to do a Black Cat series if you can bring that kind of like same energy and the same sort of action and bounce to it. Um, and then you got you know Travel Foreman back who had drawn um, four of the six Daughter of the Dragons issues. I uh, brought Farron back to letter it. So uh, Black Cat's was born out of the pages of Amazing, Amazing Spider-Man and kind of from, I don't, know, I don't know if I want to say the ashes of Daughters of the Dragon, but, uh, <laughs> you know, in the spirit of Daughters of the Dragon. Hmm, okay. Now, of course, Felicia's been a supporting character for a long time and you've need, had to uh, kind of evolve her into a main character. So how have you been approaching that? Um, 
I think it's really important when you take a character who is, I mean, you know, like Taskmaster, uh, always been playing second fiddle with someone else. Like mm-hmm. it's, you can't, it's hard to disentangle, you know, Felicia from Spider-Man, the Spider-Man stories. And in those stories, she has always played, if not an outright villainous role, uh, certainly a supporting character role. So I really wanted to put her out there, you know, front and center, uh, really get into her head uh, with her, you know, her narration, how she justifies doing <clears throat> the things she does, uh, get into her motivations, and uh, you know, show the people around her and how she interacts with them, and you know, basically build a world that's centered around her. And a big part of that was not putting Spider-Man in the book for a while. Uh, he didn't pop up until uh, you know, the first annual. Yeah. Um, and you, yeah, you've really kind of filled out her backstory with her family and we saw her shopping with her mom and <laughs> all kinds of things we probably wouldn't see if she was in Amazing Spider-Man. Um, Definitely not. I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, you said something in one of the other interviews about uh, how she'd been sexualized in the past and like when she first appeared, you know, her neckline was much higher. Um, and then like in the nineties, I think somebody decided to make it more revealing, but, um, um, so I mean, obviously the, in the art, she still looks sexy, but what's been your th- thought about, uh, how sexualized she was in the past? And hmm, I don't know. Anyway, what well, what would you say about that? Uh, I mean, when we were going forward with the book, one of the things we kind of wanted people to know when they read it is like, we're not doing uh, like a cheesecake book, you know, not like a a nineties bad girl book or whatever, whatever springs to mind when you talk about that. Um, So, but also, you know, balance the fact that, you know, black hat is, is a sexy character. She's a sexual, she's a sexual uh, person Mm -hmm. and trying to, trying to balance that mainly with a sense of agency with, that not being her only personality trait and that not being her only, uh, you know, character design note. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a character who's, who's competent, uh, but also a character who's flawed, uh, a character who makes bad decisions, makes good decisions, uh, and just try to be as rounded as possible and to have to show that that sexuality is part of the character's agency. It's not something that's meant to be you know, titillating or exploitive, but rather something that is part and parcel with her character. Yeah, and we saw her uh, have a one-night stand with Batrock there a few issues back. Um, yeah. So, you know, and, and yeah, that's not the same as being sexualized. It's just, you know, people are people are sexual. People have sexual dimensions. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a superhero world where you have beautiful people running around skin-tight clothes all the time. Like, it's, <laughs> these are people that are going to, you know, live uh, a certain amount of a sexual life. And it's not something that is, uh, you know, wildly out of control or uh, I, I don't want to say, you know, tasteless, but it's something that is an aspect of the character. Coming up, why Black Cat is afraid of Sue Storm, the dynamics of Spider-Man on a team, managing writing time, coming up with story ideas, and more. Unlock more classic early episodes of Deconstructing Comics and get access to hours of additional podcasts about MCU movies and the early Amazing Spider-Man issues by Lee and Ditko. Support this podcast and our other shows at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Welcome to the Superman Fan Podcast. My name is Billy Hogan, and I will be your host. Before we begin our journey through the time barrier, please ensure that your red indestructible capes are securely fastened around your necks so that we may all travel safely into the past to explore the Silver Age adventures of the Man of Steel in the pages of Action Comics, Superman, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane, and World's Finest Comics. After we return from our journey, I encourage you to go to the website, the supermanfanpodcast.blogspot.com. I look forward to have you join me each week to explore the Silver Age adventures of the Man of Steel. Yeah, 
So I know you mind Marvel history. Well, we've seen all all aspects of Mar- or many aspects of Marvel history in the book already, and different characters popping up. And I understand you uh, that her crew, Bruno and Doctor Corpse, had appeared some time a long time ago. What they they fought Spider Man. What was their history? Uh, yeah. So Bruno Granger and uh, Doctor Boris Corpse actually appeared in the same issue that Felicia did. Uh, her first appearance was her assembling her crew. So she okay. tracked down the, she tracked down these two dudes and they were her first crew that she set up in comics. Okay, in 1979. Her, okay. Yeah, to go break her dad out of prison. And um, after like they stuck around for like an issue or two, they the Kingpin hired them to uh, you know kick the shit out of Spider-Man, which they did. And that was that was about it. Like they turned up once in uh, like an amazing origins issue or something that like reiterated Felicia's backstory, mm. which I recently found out. But beyond that, they were basically, you know, gone until uh, we brought them back for black hat. Number one. I see. Okay. Yeah. And then in the annual Spider-Man felt like he recognized them, but he couldn't place them. And they were saying, Nope, Nope. We never met you before. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, Spider-Man has be- been beaten up by a lot of people. So uh, you can see how we <laughs> might forget them. Right, yeah, so many people. Um, now, in the early part of the run, there was this character, Sonny Ocampo. Was he original, or did he come from some past comic book? Uh, no, Sonny was a character just made up. Um, a lot of, lot of, lot of sort of the energy I was coming with going into the book was like a you know loop in the third kind of thing where you got the these breezy thieves who live a glamorous lifestyle. Uh, I was never interested in doing like a real gritty crime story or anything like that, but rather something that was, you know, exciting and fun and action packed. So Sonny came in as kind of like a Zenigata figure where there was going to be someone who was going to be chasing Felicia uh, as the story went on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ultimately, as the story went on, I felt like he kind of ran out of, ran out of room or like ran out of runway and his story just sort of, uh, he got, you know, pushed off to the side. Eventually, he said what he had to say. Felicia learned what she had to learn. And uh, we just kind of shuffled Sonny off. Yeah. Because it's just, you know, sometimes you introduce things and it really works. Sometimes you introduce things and you're like, ah, you know what? I don't think this has a whole lot of legs. Let's, you know, take this off the board and move on in another direction. Hmm. Hmm. I see. Okay. Now, um, in... Issue four of, I guess it's volume one, uh, when she had her her uh, date with Johnny Storm as an ulterior motive for uh, pulling off her heist. Um, sh- the thing that scared her most about breaking into the Fantastic Four's headquarters was Susan, um, mm-hmm. and which seemed to be not so much because of her powers, but because of her her mothering instinct. Uh, what what uh, where did that come from? What where, where did that idea come from? Well, I mean, most of the people in the Fantastic Four are fairly deeply silly. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, Johnny, you know, Johnny, we got into in that issue. Reed is, I mean, Felicia, Felicia basically feels that, you know, Reed, Johnny, or Ben, she could play. She could pull the wool over their eyes. Uh, she could finagle her way out of it. But mm-hmm. she knows that Sue Storm would see through her bullshit 100%. Hmm. And, uh, I don't think Sue Storm would appreciate people going to her house where her family lives and where her kids live uh, and messing around. Mm-hmm. So Felicia's pretty, Felicia's pretty canny in that respect and that she knows who she has to really watch out for because she knows who she can't really deal with. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's partly because it's another woman too, right? Like men, you know, she can uh, maybe manipulate better, but another woman is uh, not going to be such an easy target. Sure, but I mean, also the thing is, I think Sue is probably the canniest and the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the savviest of the Fantastic Four. Where, you know, Johnny's Johnny's a bit of a goofball, and Reed's got his, you know, head in space all the time. Yeah, and Ben is, uh, you know, Ben's always just the ever loving blue eyed thing. Whereas, you know, it's Sue who who keeps them together and uh, keeps them as a unit. I think. Right, yeah, certainly developed in that way. I mean, if you read Fantastic Four number one, it doesn't quite feel that way. But uh, as time has gone on, yeah. Fantastic Four number one was how many years ago? Yeah, 1961. Oh. (laughs) 
Um, I noticed in issue nine, uh, Felicia refers to pop rather than soda. And I'm from Iowa, so I'm saying, yeah, somebody else says pop. Somebody in media says pop. Is that what they say in, in Nova Scotia? That's what I say in pretty much all of Canada, as far as I know. Okay. No one says no one says soda here. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because you know, in, in the States, it depends on kind of the region. On the coasts, it's soda, and in the Midwest, it's pop. And, and I guess, it, like in the South, they say Coke, even if it's not Coca-Cola, so... Yeah, I mean, it's I I, I got a bit of uh, no not pushback, but you know people certainly noticed that, and I was like, oh shit, yeah, I forgot that people don't say pop everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a strange thing. I don't know why we ended up with different terms for that particular thing. Yeah, it seems strange because like the idea of saying soda for a pop. I mean, there you go. I'm, I'm betraying my own biases there, <laughs> but. It's just, it sounds like something out of like an Archie comic or something, you know, it's, it's so <laughs> yeah, like an ice cream. It's, soda. It's, it, yeah. It just, it just seems so alien to me, despite the fact that I'm, I'm well aware that people all call different things, you know, different words, but it's just one of those things that here in Canada, I think has a pretty broad application, mm -hmm. at least in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. I remember growing up, my parents saying, "No, soda, soda is something different. This is pop." It's like, okay. <laughs> um, now, in in the current uh, Black Cat in the the uh, King in Black uh, storyline, how did Felicia end up with the spider buggy? Uh, well, here's the thing about Felicia: you may not know she steals things. <laughs> I don't. Where was the spider buggy all this time? Uh. Apparently at a place with not a great security system. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just one of those things where if you are writing a book with a thief, you have a pretty clear license to say, hey, guess what? I have this thing now. Okay, yeah. And then the Goblin Glider showed up at, at Alchemex, so I don't know what yeah, it was that doing was, there. But. Well, that was um, uh, Harry Osborne had a bunch of Goblin shit in, at mm -hmm. Alchemax. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where that came from. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, was there any precedent for, like, sort of uh, street-level thieves calling the uh, magical characters Merlins, or did you come up with that? Uh, I Well, I mean, someone else may have done it uh, elsewhere, but as far as Marvel goes, I'm pretty sure I made that up. Okay. Um, it's just, I, I like the idea of there being a certain lexicon among uh the use in the marvel universe uh it kind of goes back to a bit of a pulpy sensibility that i think is fun to kind of draw upon in mm -hmm. the modern age yeah uh, so yeah that's that's just something that uh, we came up i came up with for black hat yeah i i like it and it, you used it consistently in both the beginning of the the first run and now again when talking about dr strange when she rescues him in the in the current one yeah yeah it's just it's like I me. Mean, I don't expect it to uh, to take hold in the Marvel universe as a whole, but it's, <laughs> it's fun to use for a bit of consistency. By the way, how did you end up writing so many characters with black in their names? You've already written Black Widow, Black Fox, and Black Cat. Um, are you going to be working on Black Panther next? Well, I did. Uh, I did do Ghost Panther for the Infinity Warps thing. Okay. So that was you know Black Panther mixed with Ghost Rider. Um, Though actually, I I do have Black Panther in my uh, Avengers Next Strike book right now, mm -hmm. so get, I'm getting a full set. Okay, yeah, and I did read the first issue of that. That's all that's available at the time we're recording. Yep. Uh, so where did that crazy concept come from? Uh, that just came straight from uh, Marvel Editorial. Actually, uh, they sent me an email uh, during the doldrums of book hiatus and saying we're we're getting this book together. Uh, we've got the Avengers and robot suits. Here's these suit designs. Uh, what can you do for us? And uh, yeah, that, that was just me to figure out, you know, why do the Avengers need these suits? Uh, <laughs> what are they going to do with them? I mean, obviously they're going to smack shit with them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so yeah, I had to, we had to come up with, you know, a credible threat with, for the Avengers that, you know, Earth's mightiest mortals being put on the back foot is kind of a, a big enough ask. Uh, let alone threatening them with uh, something that is, uh, a, you know, a challenge with giant robot suits. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty far out of my wheelhouse, given that, you know, 
I write Black Cat and Taskmaster, where <laughs> their, their threshold of uh, of a dangerous threat is significantly lower. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was uh, yeah. So work that out, and then we're we're off to the races. Okay, so somebody somebody at the headquarters dreamed it up for whatever reason, but um... yeah, it was a, it was a concept that came fully formed. Uh, I just had to. Uh, well, I mean, I just had to, you know, put it together, basically. The, mm-hmm. the ingredients or the the components were all there. Okay. Yeah, and I thought your justification worked. Um, Tony Stark's just been whipping these things up in his spare time. Uh, I mean, like, uh, I think I mentioned that uh, in another podcast, you know, he quit drinking. He's got to do something with his time. <laughs> um, and I, I hadn't expected Spider-Man to be in it. I haven't really kept up with the Avengers much lately, but... Um, I thought you got the right dynamic with him of how he acts when he's on a team because he always seems so socially awkward with teams. Uh, yeah. But if the situation calls for science or technology, then he steps up. Yeah, I mean, Spider Man's a really smart guy. Uh, it's just he he's not always out there, you know, tuning his own horn about it. Mm-hmm. Um, Spider Man's always a fun character, right? Especially on a team. And especially on a team in such crisis, because he's the guy who will say what everyone, what no one else wants to say because of too busy keeping a brave face. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, as, as sort of an emotional release valve for the, the story, I think he's a lot of fun to have around. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so now what you're writing Taskmaster, Black Cat, Avengers, Mixed Strike, anything else right now? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, like Taskmaster has been done for ages. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, Mech Strike's been finished for a little while. Uh, we're just, you know, putting the finishing touches in the last books. But as far as the writing, writing goes, it's been done since, oh shit, uh, late fall, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, right. I'm forgetting Black about Hat. the time lag between the writing and the publication. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's quite, uh, there's quite a, quite a space of time. I mean, I had Black Hat for, five, six, seven, eight written before he went on hiatus. So like those, those scripts are written, you know, mm-hmm. in January, almost a year ago, actually over a year ago at this point mm. in time, because when we obviously we didn't know we were going on hiatus, when we came back, uh, we came back with the King of Black tie in. Yeah. So those first three issues are written. Then we just kind of went back to what we were already doing. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think the, uh, the third issue is coming out on the 24th, right? Which is the same day this podcast is coming out. So. Yep. Next week. Okay. So, um, so what else are you working on or what are you actually working on now or that you can talk about? Yeah. So I'm working on black cat. Uh, still, we're still plugging away. Uh, I've got magic, the gathering for boom. That's coming out in April. Hmm. So that that's an ongoing series based around the characters of, you know, the card games, uh, meta plot, which, uh, has been, it's been, you know, fun to get into. Uh, I've got, uh, and then I've got a couple more series for Marvel that have not been announced yet, but should be announced, uh, probably within the next month. Okay. I hope. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, I've got an ongoing there and a mini that, uh, kind of grinding away on, which I'm, which I'm quite excited about. So I'm looking forward to being able to talk to it, talk about it, excuse me, talk to it. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you manage your writing time? I mean, I assume you're working at home and that can be kind of challenging to, to actually get the work done. Yeah, it can, it can present difficulties at times because I mean, you've got your, like I, like I don't have any kids, so that, that does make life a little easier okay. as far as getting that done. But mm-hmm. you know, you got, there's always stuff to do through the day that has to get done. You know, you gotta, I gotta buy the groceries. I gotta walk the dog. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this, that, and the other, if I, you know, either my wife's cooking dinner or I'm cooking dinner and that's more time out of your day. Um, prior to COVID, I had a pretty, you know, a pretty good routine. Actually, you know, I'd get up in the morning, I take my wife to work. And then I'd, from there, I would take the dog for a walk and I come home and basically just work until it was time to uh, go pick up my wife at the end of the day. Uh, so now, now the routine has obviously changed. Uh, my wife is working from home and, um, it's just a matter of basically finding the time and gearing up and just doing the work. It's not something I have a lot of problems or a lot of trouble with, I find, mm-hmm. which is 
just kind of the nature of the work. Uh, prior to going full time freelance for writing, I was also a teacher, and you know I really liked being a teacher, like you know working with kids and teaching lessons and stuff. But I absolutely hated doing marketing. Uh, it was brutal, mm. and it and it would just gradually pile up and pile up. And I was terrible at sitting down and making myself go through this pile of marketing. Uh, you know, and then getting this stuff entered online and this and that. Uh, whereas I, I just find I don't have that problem when I'm writing. Hmm. Uh, writing is something I'm, I'm generally always excited to do. So it's not something I, gen- I, I mean, like some some books are more difficult than others. Some come together more easily than others. But at the end of the day, I'm still very excited to be writing comic books for a living. And that excitement is what gets me going and gets me just grinding on a script. Okay. Um, so what comics writer do you most admire and why? Oh, geez. That's, that's tough. Cause I, I don't know if I can single any one writer out. I'm really bad at picking favorites. People always say like, Oh, what's your favorite? <laughs> this? What's your favorite? That? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. Um, okay. it's just, well, I find there's, I find there's so many writers that, uh, do things do different specific things that I admire. Mm-hmm. For example, that, I mean, you can look at, uh, you know, you know, a real simple one, the, uh, the over the top kind of florid dialogue you get in like Jack Kirby stuff mm-hmm. where it's just like, it's like really so like the kind of pseudo Shakespearean energy of it. It's mm-hmm. just so exciting and powerful. Um, which is not something I really do that much where most of my dialogue tends to be like more conversational or <laughs> usually cheap joke oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like there's a lot of, a lot of writers. I just think of things that I really like, like master Kung Fu. I was very into and like, you know, Doug Munch writing that was so good because it was just, it really hit a tone perfectly. And I guess that that's probably is, what I admire most about writers is if they're able to create a specific tone or a specific way of characters talking and a specific way of stories being told to create a particular tone within the book that is entirely of that book. That is, uh, you could, you would read that and you wouldn't think it was anything else. You couldn't Mm -hmm. get it confused with another series or another book. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably what I most admire about, uh, the, the writers whose work I like. Hmm. I see. Um, what's, what's a really underappreciated comic that you like? Really underappreciated comics that I like. Could be new or old or whatever. Yeah, that's a good question. Man, I have a, man, I wish you told me that ahead of time. I could have, could have <laughs> yeah, I, I should have. I'm kind of like looking around here at books I have around me. They're all actually, you know, very well appreciated. <laughs> yeah. Watchmen. No. Um. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm looking, I'm like, Oh, I've got my Corto and Maltese books. I'm like everyone loves Corto and Maltese. Like, what are you talking about? And like next to us, like a bunch of Mobius books. I'm like everyone likes Mobius. Uh, yeah, that's it's kind of tough. It's not take a little looks, look around what I got here. Yeah. It's, it's tough, tough for me to come up with that. Okay. <laughs> because, no which is, which is funny because I feel like I talk about it all the time, like on Twitter, I'm reading something. I'm like, why doesn't anybody else like this? Why are people always talking about this? But uh, I'm having a hard time popping into my head right now. Okay. Because um, everything, everything I can think of is already like very well regarded. You know? mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll take a rain check. On that. All right. No problem. Um, so uh, what do you do to inspire yourself when story ideas aren't coming or is that ever a problem? Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's a constant problem. Hmm. Uh, when you're writing, when you're writing a monthly, writing a monthly comic book, let alone four of them, you got to come up with a bunch of ideas. Um, ultimately you just kind of treat writing like it's, you know, any other sort of uh, process where in order to have an output, you need a lot of input. So I try to, you know, read a lot of comic books. I read a lot of normal books. Well, quote, sorry, quote unquote normal books. Yeah, you know comic I mean? books are abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what? I, I'm in, in the best way possible. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. You know, <laughs> of course. Uh, read novels, watch films, watch TV. Um, mm. Just, and then 
but also just, you know, look at stuff in the world around you. Like uh, every time you get, I get one of those uh, ads on Wikipedia saying like, can you please donate some money? We're dying. I always have to donate money to them. because I'm like, I use Wikipedia so much mm-hmm. just to, like track down various things or just like get, get base knowledge on things that it's, I, you know, I I can't with a clear conscience say, yeah, no, I'm not going to donate to that. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, just generally try to be widely read and like take in as much information as I can, but also try to take down a lot of notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got like notes files on my computer that go back shit, 15, 16 years. Hmm. And uh, whenever I think of something interesting or have an idea or, you know, particularly interesting set of words i'll write it down and if i'm ever stumped i can always just go back and see what those things inspire uh, see what i can kind of free associate from stuff mm-hmm. I re- i've written down for like the past however many years because while, while an idea may not be useful at the time it can often be useful down the road mm-hmm. well i think something that we readers don't appreciate enough is that often fiction or or other kinds of creative stuff are not like cut from whole cloth they're inspired by other things and there's a lot of something else uh in there (laughs) you know even the beatles you can identify other songs that sound you know kind of similar to beatles songs that they adapted into their own their own thing oh yeah i mean you can't like nobody's gonna believe you when you say that uh you know whatever form of art or media you create we say you have no influences you know Mm -hmm. it all all comes from somewhere and it's just a matter of you know you try to be aware of what influences you have and use that to better your work and i wouldn't say rise above your influences but certainly use that to try to create something that is something that is yours you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh what are your future ambitions for your writing uh, currently to just keep working and not have my books get canceled. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah that's, that helps. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, I want to keep black hat going. It's, I think it's a, a book that I'm really proud of and I've got a lot more like to do with it. Mm-hmm. Generally I like, you know, like to try, try new things, uh, work in different areas that, uh, I'm not, that not necessarily used or, or don't have a lot of experience in just try to, you know, better the work that I create. Uh, I'd like to do some creator own stuff. Uh, I've never actually done any creator own comics uh, of any note. So that's sort of a blind spot in my experience that I'd mm-hmm. like to, you know, remedy and, you know, make, make something outside of the superhero universe, which I really enjoy and it's a lot of fun, but uh, you want to uh, kind of broaden your horizons as much as you can. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've been, I've been really enjoying the stuff that you've, done for marvel so i'll be uh, looking forward to to more from you oh great thank you um so yeah uh thanks so much for coming on the podcast this has been great oh no problem thank you for having me on black cat number three comes out today avengers mech strike number two will be out march 3rd and taskmaster number four is coming march 10th Want to support this podcast? You can help us out by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics and go to deconstructingcomics.com to connect to us on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, to shop on Amazon to support the show, and to find links to subscribe to the podcast. Our theme is by J.B. Anderton. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and we'll critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. This Saturday, Jason McNamara joins me to discuss Duplicate by Carla Nappi and Mariana Strakowska. Then next Wednesday, Deconstructing Comics takes a week off, and instead we present, from the archives of our Patreon podcasts, Mulele's in my discussion of Iron Man 3. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics.